All right, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you here at the Is Genesis History Conference. We're gonna be talking about mutations and natural selection. Uh, my name is Joe DeWeese. Um, uh, studied biochemistry and enzymology for a number of years now and uh, would like to talk with you about some of my understanding about mutations and natural selection because I think it's something really critical for us to understand and understand how these things work in nature. Now certainly this is a, a critical component of neo-Darwinian theory so as you think about neo-Darwinian theory you at least have at least three and maybe more things that it would be built on. One would be that all life arose from non-life uh, but you would also have things like common ancestry, that all life arose from a common ancestor. And then the idea that the source of and means of variation among that would be natural selection. Uh, and even Darwin, of course, uh, is quoted as saying, I'm convinced that natural selection has been the main, but not the exclusive means of modification. So it was really core to, you know, his, his theory. So uh, when he wrote... Um, his work, Origin of Species, the full title, right, is much longer uh, and is really more about on the origin of species by means of natural selection and it goes on from there. There's more to the title. So is natural selection the source of variation? Uh, philosopher of biology Alex Rosenberg suggests the source of demystification here can only be the natural selection. The origin of species, Darwin made two broad claims, both of them about what happened on the earth over a long period and what caused it to happen. The common descent of a large but finite number of particular biological systems on the planet and the, and the importance of natural selection as the source of their diversity, complexity, and adaptation. And so this is Rosenberg, uh, who happens to be a physicalist and an atheist, his take on uh, interpreting Darwin. Uh, I think it's clear that um, natural selection can be viewed uh, more as a filter or a sieve. Kirshner and Gerhardt suggest there are limits on what selection can accomplish. We must remember it acts merely as a sieve, preserving some variants and rejecting others. It does not create variation. And I think even Rosenberg would agree with that uh, in his statement. He says the process takes the variant trait, talking about natural selection in each generation, and filters them for fitness differences. He, that is Darwin, should have called it environmental filtration. For the process that Darwin envisioned gives nature only a passive role. Uh, Rosenberg objects to the idea of natural selection because it sounds like there's something actually actively selecting, right? It's almost a, a conscious process like breeding might be for, per se. Uh, but instead, it's more of a passive process. So environmental filtration, if you can, in your mind, when you hear natural selection, consider it as environmental filtration. And sometimes people summarize it and they say, well, it's survival of the fittest. And, and maybe in some definitions that works. But then you have to ask the question, what does it mean to be fittest, right? How do you define fitness? And that's led some um, biologists and others to try to define natural selection in a way that does not this is part of that, that measurement or that metric. Uh, and so not all definitions of natural selection necessarily require that uh, as part of it. So uh, I don't want to overgeneralize it and say, well, it's survival of the fittest because that doesn't necessarily fit all of the various definitions of this concept. Uh, but I think something that we can hold on to here is the idea that natural selection does not create the variation. It acts upon existing variation. Uh, and it tends to remove, it tends to act as a filter. And that's a really interesting concept. Um, uh, Dr. Paul Nelson illustrates it kind of like this. He suggests if you start with uh, a population of some uh, different organisms and they go through some experience, uh, some filtering event, you could imagine a scenario with, let's say, an antibiotic, right? You add, introduce an antibiotic into a patient, and let's say that uh, that particular antibiotic is only partially effective against some bacteria and maybe not effective against others. And so you might have a scenario where it get, starts getting rid of most of the blue ones, but it doesn't really affect the yellow ones, and they begin to kind of overpopulate. You give another dose of it, let's say, and maybe you've wiped out now all the blue ones, but you've got now a growing population of the yellow ones. We saw this earlier this year with my daughter. Uh, she had an ear infection. We thought we cleared it up. We thought everything was great, and all of a sudden, boom, it's back again, uh, full force, probably worse than before. And we went back and they said, well, let's try a different antibiotic, right? Let's try another approach. The idea here being that these selective events are acting as a filter and they're filtering out the things that can't make it, the things that can't survive. Uh, and so selection in that sense is more of a filter. 
DeVry said, natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. And I think that still fits my understanding of, of natural selection as I understand it today. But we still have a lot of examples of adaptation and variation. Dr. Wood mentioned a number of examples this morning in one of our sessions. Uh, and we could talk about peppered moths uh, as, as examples of, of variation. We could talk about, for example, fruit flies which have been a huge uh, boost in our understanding of developmental biology and the importance of developmental genes. We could talk about the finch beaks, uh, as Dr. Wood mentioned this morning. And I think these examples help us understand variation. Uh, they may help us understand adaptation. But what you see missing in these examples is the, is the actual generation of novelty, something new, some new feature, some new function. So let's stop for a minute and talk about what are mutations and, and do they help this picture any? Do they help us understand how natural selection and mutation may actually work together? Uh, as you recall, we've talked about this uh, a few times this week about DNA, the double helical nature of DNA. We've got our little model here. Um, and uh, in our double helical structure, you've got base pairs along the backbone of DNA. And um, the pairs are, this is a nice colored model, so everything is nice and colored for you. But if you change a nucleotide at one position, it could end up changing the opposite position, right? So a mutation might be a change in one of these nucleotides. Or a mutation might be the deletion of these nucleotides uh, or the duplication of them. There could be a number of different things that could happen uh, in the form of a mutation. And so we have uh, a number of different types of mutations that could exist. So uh, commonly, uh, we think of single nucleotide changes or SNPs, uh, probably the most common form of that. Uh, Dr. Wood talked about that earlier this week. It's a, it's a really large number compared to some of the other changes that we see. Uh, but you can see how that if we change something in the nucleotide, it could change our RNA sequence and potentially change a protein sequence, though it doesn't always, because we understand there are non-coding regions of DNA that aren't making uh, protein coding RNA segments. Uh, and we also know that there's some redundancy in the genetic code. And so if you think about the standard genetic code as we have depicted here, thanks to uh, the all-powerful Wikipedia, um, as you go along here, you notice that there are certain uh, amino acids that are coded for by multiple codons. And so uh, as you read this chart, they've got first base, the second base, and the third base, and then they've uh, thankfully put all of those together in a group for us. So notice there's, there's a pretty large group here that codes for leucine. So you could have a lot of changes that potentially could give you the same nucleotide or the same codon set that would eventually end up with the same amino acid. Does that make sense? So it doesn't necessarily, every mutation does not necessarily lead to a change in a protein, right? Some do, but not all of them do. And then what about mutations that occur in non-coding regions, right? Their, their consequences are far less defined. It's far less certain exactly what will happen if the mutation is in some non-coding region, whether it's an intron or some uh, space between genes. So the analogy of the genome, if we think of the genome as a book, it's a really big book, contains chapters. We could look at it as having chapters, paragraphs, sentences, words, letters. Uh, and we have four letters in our book, right, A, T, C, and G. And those four letters are put together in a combination that's over three billion letters long, right? So that's a really, really big book, very long book, huge. And how do changes in the letters of a book affect the book? What, what about changes in the letters of the genome? Well, we know if we have a textbook, right, that we start changing the letters of, it's going to change something about the information conveyed in that book. And the same thing is true in DNA, but the question is how much does it change, right? If, you've got, if you pull out your favorite or least favorite, as the case may be, biochemistry textbook, and you randomly change a letter on one page, is it going to destroy the meaning of the biochemistry textbook? Probably not. It might mess up a sentence, right? It might mess something up, but it's not going to have a huge change. But if you have changes that occur over time, it could really add up. And what we know about mutations in humans is that we're passing on 60 to 100 new mutations each generation to our children. That's what it appears to be from uh, the evidence out there. And so these numbers are adding up over time. And the question is, what's happening with those changes over time? So, um, you know, what types of mutations could be seen in an organism? Could we see a gain of function? Could we see a modification of function? 
Could we see a loss of function? I'd like to suggest to you that we could see all of those. All of those are possible. Uh, and I think we could probably give examples of, of each of these on some level occurring potentially in a new, uh, in a new way in an organism. But sometimes we talk about mutations and we really only look at the, maybe the effect and we don't really consider the type of change. Right? So we talk about mutations, we say, well, they're very rare and most of them are bad. Well, what do you mean by bad? Right? What does that really mean to say a mutation might be bad? So let's just consider that we could have each of these different types of changes, gain of function, modification of function, loss of function, and the effect is separate from the type of change. Is everybody following me here? In other words, we could have a beneficial loss of function. We could have a detrimental gain of function. I think we see that in cancer. I think we see uh, mutations in cancer that lead to the malfunctioning of genes that I consider to be kind of, in some cases, a new function. But it's not a good function, right? It's bad because it actually could lead to cancer uh, in the individual. So I'd like for you to consider that we have to be really careful when we talk about mutations, asking both what's the type of change and what's the consequence of the change? Is it going to help the organism? Is it not going to help the organism? Right? Is it kind of indifferent? Do we, can we not detect it? And I would argue that probably a lot of things we're going to have a real hard time detecting. Right? This, the 80 to 100 new mutations that I got from my parents, am, can I tell <laughs> you know, where those mutations are? I don't know that I ever will. Right? Now, uh, you could take my wife, for example. She has a particular mutation that leads to her blood basically being able to clot really, really well. We could actually look at her parents and figure out, did either of them have that mutation and pass it on to her, right? So there's a, in other words, there's enough of a phenotype that we know she's got something different, but is it any different than what her parents had? So we would have to go back, of course, and test their genetics to say, well, did they have that or did that develop uh, in the egg that eventually became my wife? So, are there beneficial mutations? Um, and let me just, these are some that I hear discussed from time to time. I just want to talk about a few of these examples just very briefly just to consider uh, what, we, what we think of as being beneficial to an organism. Uh, sickle cell disease is where we'll start. It's a very common uh, discussion because there are a lot of people affected by this particular mutation. And um, the interesting thing about it is it's a broken protein, right? So the mutation that is associated with sickle cell disease means that in, in patients that have this, they're going to have a broken copy of hemoglobin, right? at least one and maybe two, right? depending upon whether they're heterozygous or homozygous. But the really interesting thing is that it actually has a health benefit with regard to resistance to malaria. Now, individuals who are homozygous have far more health <laughs> negative health effects than, that I think outweigh the benefit of resistance to malaria for most people who have this particular mutation, especially if they don't live in a region where malaria is an issue. Uh, we've, we've got, uh, I know folks who actually are on basically anti-cancer medications to help their body express a different version of hemoglobin just to deal with this particular mutation. So uh, I don't think it's unequivocally good or beneficial, but it does confer some benefit. And note that heterozygotes do have that benefit, meaning someone who's heterozygous has one good copy and one mutated copy, they do have that resistance to malaria. Now what you know about their red blood cells though is that the red blood cells that have this mutation and are, and are expressing this type of hemoglobin uh, are only going to live a very short period of time, maybe, what, 10 to 12 days or something like that. It's a very short lifespan for red blood cell compared to the normal. And so it's, uh, overall, it's not an unequ unequivocally positive mutation, uh, I would argue. And so there, there's a major consequence here. Uh, but also notice, what, what is the mutation doing? Ask yourself, what's the actual mutation doing? Well, it's breaking a protein, right? So this is a loss of function that has some benefit in certain circumstances, all right? So if we're trying to categorize it, I want you to think of it that way. Uh, the, the mutation, by the way, and I, I meant to kind of mention this, so the mutation changes such that we have this... Um, glutamic acid, which has changed to a valine, and now this valine uh, is relatively hydrophobic. It's trying to bind into a pocket of an adjacent protein, and now all of our hemoglobin clumps 
uh, once it gets deoxygenated, which is bad, right? Because what, where it tends to clump is uh, out in the extremities, and it makes it very painful for the patients that, that have this. What about bacterial studies? Uh, Dr. Richard Linsky has been growing E. coli for over 60,000 generations. I think there's somewhere 63, 64,000 and upwards by now, which is really cool. And this is some amazing science, I think, that they're doing because what they've done over the trajectory of time is really, really neat to just step back and look at all of the data they've acquired. And so what they've been trying to measure is, can we find E. coli that are growing faster than other E. coli? Can we actually see any type of fitness gain over time? And of course, you have to say, well, how do they measure fitness? In this case, they're comparing growth rates uh, of the mutated strains versus the original. Okay, so everybody following that? So we're looking at how fast do the mutated strains grow versus uh, the kind of the original pace, the original rate. And so over time, they've, they've actually found they've had a number of mutations that have increased the growth rate. So in, in a sense, in this experiment, you can say, well, maybe these things are very beneficial to the organism, right? They're actually allowing these organisms to grow faster. But the question is, what kind of mutations are they? Are these gain of function? Are they loss of function? In other words, uh, what's going on in these mutations and, and how does that work? This is a table showing just a, a few of the mutations from Linsky studies, so this is not all of them, but I just gave some examples, and my understanding is some of these have some of the largest effect on fitness. In other words, these are the ones that tended to give the most growth increase. Is everybody following me on that? So we're growing faster. And so we have, for example, the uh, inactivation of the NAD repressor, uh, which likely increases production of the coenzymes NAD, uh, so it's a, a loss of function, and we lost a repressor function, and it has a fitness benefit to the organism. Okay, all right, that, I, can, I can see how that's, uh, that works. All right, inactivation of pike F. So this, uh, this one, I don't know if they actually have shown the biochemical details of it just yet, but they think it may actually slow down glycolysis, uh, and we would look at this possibly as a loss or a modification of function, uh, and so uh, the idea is that maybe this actually allows for uh, more energy uh, utilization within the cell uh, so that they can grow, uh, basically grow faster. SPO-T, and so this is a mutation that lowers the expression of flagella encoding genes. Uh, and again, it's a loss of function, right? We're not, if we're in a culture flask that is shaking round and round, do we need a flagellum? We're okay without it, right? We can lose that, lose the production of all those proteins, and probably grow more efficiently, right? That makes sense. The ribose operon, so there's deletion or part of all the genes used to make ribose. Again, a loss of function. Uh, and the most popular one is this one, CIT-T operon. So this is where the citrate transporter gene was amplified and basically took residence up next to a different promoter that allowed it to be expressed all the time. So it was under the control of a promoter that only allowed it to be expressed under certain conditions. Um, but, uh, for example, anaerobic, and now it can be expressed all the time. And that's, to me, that's a pretty cool mutation when you think about it. Now, step back and ask, if we took these same organisms and put them in the environment, would they be better suited in their environment? And the answer is, of course, probably not, right? If you lost your flagellum, you're kind of in trouble. Right, And so the same is true of several other of these mutations. There's, it's probably not great for in the environment, but in these conditions, uh, these mutations work. So, so no new novel production genes produced, and, and really it looks to be like a loss of information or regulatory control. Uh, Behe summarized uh, in, in a review he did several years ago his views on um, microbial and viral evolution experiments by saying, uh, what he called the first rule of adaptive evolution. That is to break or blunt any functional coded element whose loss would yield a net fitness gain. Uh, and this kind of makes sense, right? If, you're, uh, if, you, if you've got a car and you want to try to make this car go faster, what are some of the things that you can do? Well, you can start taking parts off the car, right? You can start losing things that are maybe non-essential to you. 
uh, and it might lighten the car some. It might allow you to go a little bit, little bit faster. Right? It might not be as safe right? if you tear the doors off and you do various things like that, but you might actually go a little faster. But it may not work better necessarily out in the environment. And so we have to think through and understand why would certain mutations be favored in a particular set of circumstances. And the challenge that we're limited to as scientists is we've got to study this under a set of circumstances that's defined. In other words, we can't just say, well, let's expose it to everything. You've got to expose it to something you can control. And so that's a limitation of these experiments, and it's understood that that's part of the nature of the way these experiments go, uh, because that's really how it works. But what, another thing that I thought was interesting, though, about this SIT-T mutation, so some researchers went back and said, let's see how rare the SIT-T mutation really could be. And they actually took uh, a series of, of experiments to look at it, and they were able, it says, using similar media, uh, 46 independent citrate utilizing mutants were isolated in as few as 12 to 100 generations. And as they looked at the DNA to see what changes occurred, they found changes consistent with what Linsky's group saw. Uh, and their, their conclusion was um, that the rarity of, the, uh, of this particular mutant in Linsky's experiments may have actually been an artifact of the experimental conditions and not so much a unique event. Uh, they conclude that no new genetic information or novel gene function evolved as a result of this. So I think that's a, kind of an interesting, this is from the Journal of Bacteriology just last year, uh, Scott Minich's lab. So uh, I think it's important for us to consider um, that these mutations uh, that, that we're seeing are not necessarily things that, I mean, this, this may actually happen fairly commonly, but it's not generating anything new. Uh, so th it'll be interesting to study this some more and to learn more about uh, how that uh, mechanism unfolds. What about antibiotic resistance? So one of the things I do is I teach pharmacy students, and one of the things we hear a lot about is antimicrobial stewardship, right? The idea that we need to be mindful of how we're dispensing uh, antibiotics. Are we being, uh, you know, using too much of a particular type of antibiotic, giving it too frequently? There are a lot of questions out there about that because the thought is we don't want the microbes that are out there to evolve resistance to all the antibiotics we're using, right? And it's a very reasonable concern, I think. Um, and so what we, what we know, though, is that we know the modes of resistance that exist. Uh, for example, could be a change of regulation, so how the protein is produced. That tends to be a kind of a faster response. It could be a duplication or amplification of genes that facilitate resistance. All right, so that's still kind of a faster response. It might be point mutations in the actual proteins themselves. And notice that's quite a bit slower uh, in terms of response time compared to some of these other forms uh, of resistance. Uh, an important thing to know is that in a lot of cases, resistance can also be mediated by genes that exist on plasmids, which get shuttled around between these bacteria in populations. And so um, there are enzymes that exist in nature that can destroy these molecules or inactivate these molecules generally. Um, because if you think about how we've designed a lot of the antibiotics that have been designed over the years, they're based on what? A lot of them were based on natural products, things that already occurred in the environment. What's interesting is they've been able to take bacterial samples that were frozen down or, or maybe were from ancient sources uh, before some of our modern antibiotics were even made, and guess what they've found in some cases? There are actually microbes that are already resistant to antibiotics, even though we think they've never been exposed to them because we made them much more recently than we think those bacteria lived. So it's a very interesting thing that resistance already was present in those microbes. And so I think that's a really uh, cool thing to consider. But it, it is an important health question, right? Because we have to ask the question, how much can these bacteria change to outsmart the antibiotics that we're designing and utilizing on them, right? That's, a, that's an important health question that, that I think we could look at with regard to this. So what mutations do we actually see, right? If we were kind of to chart it out, you know, can we see um, a beneficial gain of function? Can we see a, an undetectable gain of function or a detrimental gain of function? What about a detrimental loss of function? Could we see these things in nature? I think we can. 
Uh, and maybe some of these we don't see because the organism just doesn't survive at all, right? So some of these kind of in the detrimental column, there's probably some of all of those, right, that we never really see because maybe the organism cannot survive to develop and actually grow. Uh, so it's really hard to say exactly what mutations are, uh, are around because, you know, again, we don't have everything, we can't observe everything. But if we were to hypothesize, would it look something like this? Would we say that the beneficial end, there's very few. The detrimental end, there's more. Maybe the undetectable is somewhere close to the detrimental. It's really hard to tell. So I put those X's up there not to say that's a quantification of it, but it's a, it's a conceptual idea. Um, John Sanford spent some time talking about um, you know, basically what we might consider to be neutral evolution and the idea that there are certain things that can be selected for and certain things that cannot. And he suggested that, that maybe there are some mutations that exist in a zone here that are so subtle that natural selection is not strong enough to select for or against. All right? So there are changes that may be detrimental. Right? So if they're on this side, they're detrimental. But they're not strong enough to eliminate that organism from a natural selection perspective. Uh, and this, if this is true, this is a really not a good thing because what you have here is you've got mutation without the possibility of selection. And if you can't select against things that are detrimental, what you have is a gradual accumulation of things that are increasingly detrimental over time. So the question is how much of that do we actually observe? And I think it's an open question and it's fair to ask and to, to try to examine this concept. You know, we could consider the CIT mutation a beneficial loss of function. In other words, it's a broken on-off switch, right? Because now it's on all the time. But it's beneficial to the organism in that circumstance. It may not be beneficial out in nature, but in the circumstance where citrate is all they have to eat, it might be beneficial. So how far can change go? Um, Michael Behe has examined this. Of course, he's the one that wrote Darwin's Black Box, uh, The Irreducible Complexity. Uh, the book on irreducible complexity. He's also written a book called Edge of Evolution. I encourage you to consider the examples he gives in there. Uh, for example, the malarial parasite and how long does it take for malarial parasite to develop resistance to chloroquine? Right? How long does that take and is that reasonable for it to have taken that long? I think it's a worthwhile study. I'll leave that there, let you go read that and look that up. But just understand that um, one of his conclusions is, in essence, that there are some changes that are so far that it may not be reasonable to expect that from an organism in nature. And I think that's a fair, uh, a fair thing to consider. There's also a concept, I'm, I'm not going to spend time on this, but there's a concept called the, the mutation waiting time problem in humans. And this is the idea that, um, as Dr. Wood was talking about earlier uh, in this conference, the idea that we reproduce at such slow rates Right? We really don't have huge, uh, the ability to really uh, fix mutations into a population very easily. And so it could take a long time. So there are certain modeling uh, studies that have gone on to, to suggest it could take a long time to fix mutations. So I'd like to suggest to you that, it, that this model may be possible, that there may just be some mutations that are so subtle that we can't really select for or against them. And, and, and there are some very rare beneficial mutations. Uh, I think there's a study here that suggests that. They can be detected, but they're very rare compared to the deleterious ones on this other side. Now these ones are ones that will be killed off by natural selection, right? They're so bad that in theory they're gonna be, they're gonna be knocked off. But there may be some on this, this zone right here which can't really be selected for or against because they're so slightly negative or so slightly positive that by random chance, some of them are going to be preserved and some of them aren't, right? They're, they're going to be uh, kind of mixed together there. Sanford suggests that, uh, he suggests that basically mutation selection cannot create a single gene ever, uh, according to the way he models it. Neutral evolution, this is a, a note from an article um, Originally proposed by Moto Kimura, Jack King, and, and Thomas Jukes, the neutral theory of molecular evolution is inherently non-Darwinian. Darwinism asserts that natural selection is the driving force of evolutionary chain, change. It is the claim of the neutral theory, on the other hand, that the majority of evolutionary change is due to chance. What I want you to understand about this is that while natural selection 
is playing a role in selecting for or against various things, there are a lot of things that get preserved based on chance. And the way that that's described sometimes in the literature is either by this term neutral evolution or by the concept of genetic drift. Right? So you'll hear those terms, and I, want, I wanted you to be familiar with those ideas. So genetic drift, this particular definition uh, comes from this source. Genetic drift along with natural selection, mutation, migration is one of the basic mechanisms of evolution. Uh, and so it's part of, it's understood to be part of evolution. And, and the idea here is we have mutations that can accumulate without selection. Some mutations are going to be preserved, some are going to be lost. Right? And that, th that may be random as to which ones are saved and which ones aren't. So what kind of mutations do we really need? Well, if, um, if an evolutionist would like to go from one form of an organism to some new feature and function and new form of an organism, you imagine a scenario where there's going to need to be new features, right? Maybe new proteins, maybe new functions, right? So what types of changes would be needed to, to give that type of change? Um, Stephen Meyer quotes John McDonald in his work, and he suggests that the genes that are obviously variable within natural populations seem to affect only minor aspects of form and function, while those genes that govern major changes, the very stuff of macroevolution, apparently do not vary or vary only to the detriment of the organism. The kind of mutations we need for major evolutionary change we don't get, the kind we get we don't need. And this was in context discussing, um, in the context of Meyer's book, he's discussing developmental gene changes in things like fruit flies. And you can, you can change developmental genes and get some really, really crazy fruit flies that have extra wings, extra legs, etc. And you can study that and examine. I think there's a lot you can learn about development from changing those genes. But I think one of the points that we learn from that is when you change those control genes, um, the types of events that you get really aren't what we would want if we're trying to evolve to another type of organism. Uh, and so I think it's really important for us to consider that the most frequent changes and mutations aren't really in those types of genes. The developmental genes appear to be pretty well protected uh, for the most part. Peterson and Mueller suggest only after a trait is present in its rudimentary form and if its expression contains some variation that can be selected on, notice selection is needed here, the population genetic mode of variation may take over then to refine a novelty. In light of these findings and despite perpetuated assertions to the contrary, microevolutionary events are insufficient for explaining discontinuous forms of change and phenotypic novelties. The idea that small continuous incremental variational change is the sole cause of phenotypic evolution continues to be challenged by qualitatively discontinuous changes that also need to be accounted for by evolutionary theory. What's he saying, right? He's talking about the idea that if, if you think macroevolution, the development of new features, is simply microevolution over and over and over, that's insufficient. There, there are boundaries. There are chari uh, changes that are discontinuous uh, that have to be bridged, and, and they're... Uh, these are evolutionists writing this, but, but they're acknowledging that it's not simply microevolutionary events that are needed there. So mutations or changes in the genetic information, they take various forms, have many different effects. Uh, Long-term evolution experiments are you know, a way of giving us an idea of what types of changes could occur in very fixed settings. Antibiotic resistance also gives us a means for kind of thinking about and considering the types of mutations that are possible. Uh, but not necessarily the development of new functions. We don't necessarily see that uh, in those examples. And, um, oh, let me go back one here. So concepts to consider. What, what can we learn from this from a creation perspective? What do we need to, to take away from this? I think there's some really important questions. Uh, as Dr. Wood has talked about, the creation narrative is not entirely prescriptive. It doesn't give us a, an exact set of rules for all of the details, for example, of genetics. And so we're free to ask some questions. We're free to con consider possible different hypotheses and ideas. How much variation was present in the beginning, right? If you, if you have a created kind, as God uh, allowed that process and guided that process forward, was there only one pair of cats? Right? Was there only one pair of horses? Uh, 
or were there multiple different types of organisms that would be within that kind? Were the animals in the kind genetically identical or were they heterozygous? In other words, were all of their genes in their genome the same, same alleles, or did they have heterozygous differences within each organism? I think that's a fair question to ask. I don't know that we have, we don't have an answer for that, but I think we can ask that question. Have mutation rates been constant? Is there evidence of change? Dr. Wood mentioned earlier this week that there are models that might suggest you have certain periods of time where maybe mutations uh, rates were elevated, right? So we, these, are, these are questions we can ask and potentially try to model uh, answers to them. Were organisms designed with the ability to adapt and change? Right? What role do transposable elements play in that? What role do other uh, genetic features play in the ability of an organism to change and adapt to its environment, to adapt to what's going on around it? What role have natural selection and genetic drift played in this process? Right? How many of the mutations in us today are just there by random chance and genetic drift versus things that maybe were part of the original um, variation in the beginning? I think it's a good question to ask. So, so were organized, and I've got that twice there, but, but were organisms designed to adapt and to change their environments? And I, I think the answer to that, in my opinion, is yes. Now the question is how much adaptation is possible, how much goes on, how much do we see, uh, and how much was built in from the beginning, I think is an interesting question. I don't know that we have an answer to it, but it certainly is an interesting question. So. I appreciate everybody uh, paying attention today. I know it's late in the afternoon. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. And uh, those of you in Facebook land, thank you for joining us here at Freed Hardeman. Hopefully you've enjoyed some of our discussion. And I hope you all have a great day. Thanks. OK, we'll take some questions, if there are any. I can't promise answers. Yes. Have they ever found in any um, studies with the bacteria or any other or microorganisms? Okay. Okay. There have been a new species found over and over throughout the generations from these minor mutations. Has that ever been seen? Mm. So the question is, are there examples of mutations where new, did you say new species of bacteria? Yeah. Is that kind of what you're thinking? It's like a macroevolution of a bacteria. Macroevolution. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. It's a good question. Yes? Would uh, human eye color be an example of mutations that aren't selected for or against? Mm, that's a good question. Um, we'd have to look at the genes that are involved in eye color, which I'm not an expert on, but we, would, we could look back potentially and examine what are the different variants that are present in the genes that make up eye color. Uh, and you might be able to actually test whether it looks like those are things that maybe have changed over time. Has there been some drift involved in that? I think those are, those are good things that you could ask. It's a good question. Sorry, I'm not doing great at answering questions right now. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, ma'am. So we expect to see a lot less change in this very short time post-flood to modern times. You think of how much humans changed in yeah. that time, but our generation time is so long compared to most of the other right. animals out of the ark. I mean, I don't know how much we know about... Uh, things that affect brain function. I think of even just how the infection of the Zika virus can cause microcephalic mm, babies. Right. You see a dramatic change in just in a small thing. I mean, I don't know if we can postulate any sort right. of things that happen to some of, some of the people post-blood. So I think that's a really good question. What was What were the genomes of Noah and his sons and their wives like versus what we, what we have today? And I think that, that's a fantastic question because you have people at that time who are still living very long times compared to us. And so there's clearly something very different. Now, will we be able to kind of turn back the clock and figure out what changes along the way led from us being able to live that long to where we are today? It may be that some of that, the lifespan may not be entirely genetic. Uh, in other words, maybe more about our environment food sources, et cetera. But there's a component of it that I would suggest has got to be genetic. And so the question is, which genes uh, appear to be the most important in allowing them to have lived as long as they did and developed the way they did and have um, apparently the, the knowledge and understanding that they did, which is 
pretty impressive if you look at the things that people were able to do. So that's a good question.